Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller and my guest today is award-winning journalist and broadcaster Misha Glennie. Misha first came to prominence for his coverage of the Balkans at the time of Yugoslavia's collapse. He went on to publish a vast best-selling history of the Balkans in 1999 and his expertise in Eastern Europe provided a starting point for his latest book, MacMafia. The breakup of the Soviet Union and the liberalisation of Eastern Europe are two of the key forces which have contributed to the massive rise in organised crime in the past two decades. The book involved Misha in three years of travelling, research and writing in locations as distant as Colombia, Dubai and China. When we met, I asked him what had started him down this path. I identified this phenomenon that it emerged out of the collapse of communism and globalization that had seized a large part of the global economy and global politics and yet was only ever discussed incidentally or anecdotally. And so what, what I felt I wanted to do with it was to, was to map this phenomenon and basically lay down the basic cartography of how organized crime, corruption, you know, the new capitalist classes of developing markets and consumer attitudes in, in the West had created this incredible space of the shadow economy. But it's only a basic cartography and it's for other people now to build upon it. Did you find in the process of researching the book that some of your own preconceptions had to be reevaluated? about the nature of the people that you were, you were dealing with. I mean, it struck me that in the organized crime tag, organized is, is just as important as, as the crime part. Well, it certainly changed my perception. I mean, the interesting, the, the changed my perception of the whole sense of organized crime is, is that it's actually much more decentralized and arbitrary than it may at first see. You have seen, you have one or two organizations which are notorious some of the Moscow or Russian crime gangs, the Colombians and their cartels and so on. But actually, if you look at the structure of those organizations, despite the sort of legendary position that figures like Pablo Escobar, the uh, late leader of the Medellin cartel, despite those, those figures and their uh, folklore projections, actually they're very decentralized organizations. So that when, Medi when Escobar is killed, Nothing happens in terms of the distribution of cocaine around the United States. You can decapitate the head of an organization, but the organism continues to live. It's almost as though the, there is no central nervous system, but every little bit has a functioning central nervous system that can act independently of any other bit of the organization. And this is something, as I look particularly into the Russian organized crime communities, I noticed was very striking that essentially, although you did have a boss, the boss was essentially an organizer who would accept tributes from the various organized crime groups below him. And in exchange for that, they were able to claim themselves to be part of this, uh, in the case of the group I looked at in Russia, the Sonseva organization. And this gave them tremendous kudos. And it also alerted other people that in the event of you facing down somebody like a member of Sonseva, then they would be able to mobilize all sorts of other groups whose threat of violence was convincing. And the setup you just described of the decentralized nature of, of a drugs cartel, for example, sounds very like you know a fast food franchise, doesn't it? And that sort of brings up the point that that the, the black economy kind of apes the structures and the approaches of, of the white economy. I, I think what the black economy does is it looks and sees which of those bits work mm -hmm. and which don't. And the franchising is one bit that definitely works. And that's where the title of the book, McMafia, comes from, is, is it's like uh, McDonald's. You know, and there was this case that I came across in the research, according to Mark Galliotti, who's um, a British academic who works a lot on organized crime, was that the Chechen Mafia in Moscow, who were a very powerful Moscow uh, Mafia, were, was effectively selling its name to organizations around Russia, even though those organizations did not have to contain a single Chechen in them. You mentioned the, the marijuana producer in British Columbia, and that seemed to me to really bring up a big 
ethical question because on one side of the Canadian-American border, you've got Canada, who have got a much more liberally inclined attitude towards drugs, and then in the south you've got the United States who've got their their war on drugs, which you know for the past twenty five years hasn't delivered what what the billions of dollars that have been pumped into have been expected to deliver. And I thought that really brought up a big ethical issue about how you actually tackle crime because the prohibition creates the conditions in which it flourishes, and yet society doesn't seem ready to to do anything about that. Well, I think it's more than an ethical question. It is an ethical question, but it's also a political question. And indeed, it's an economic question. This is, I think, probably the biggest single issue that emerged from the book. The other issues which encourage organized crime, like poverty in large parts of the world, excessive spending power in the Western world, and so on, those are things which equally apply to the to the licit markets. And in that sense, organized crime is is no different. But in this one, in the narcotics issue, the drugs issue, there is a, a real problem here of appallingly misdirected policy, that is the war on drugs, which, although primarily an American venture, is to a degree supported by the European Union and Canada. And those are the two critical geographical areas beyond this. Now, you're right that in Canada, attitudes are generally more liberal, although the current administration of Stephen Harper, the minority government, is very hostile to drug law reform. But this is creating tremendous problems now in Canada as well, with Harper's relatively hardline policy, because it is accentuating a competition in uh, British Columbia in particular, and potential for profits are being driven higher, and that means it is becoming more violent. And what's happening in British Columbia also around Vancouver and the West Coast is is that you're seeing a, a merging of the relatively benign industry of marijuana with the cocaine industry. And people involved in the cocaine industry also trying to get a piece of the action of the marijuana industry. When you get further east in British Columbia and you just have the marijuana industry, which is uh, largely driven by what are called mum and pup grow ops, which are just ordinary folks, you know, having a little marijuana farm in their basement and uh, uh, generating a huge amount of money. I mean, five percent of British Columbia's B- uh, B- uh, British Columbia's GDP is the marijuana industry. But what you're now seeing because of that violent competition in Vancouver is the killings have become and have started in Vancouver, and this is over the past six months or so. And there are now regular shootouts and deaths uh, because of this in BC. This is a consequence of the war on drugs. There is, however, a steady movement in Europe, in some parts of Europe, in important parts of Europe, and in Canada, towards readdressing this issue and dumping the war on drugs. There is also some support for this in the United States, particularly on, a, on, a, in, on the level of individual states, where you now have uh, nine of them where, where possession of marijuana is not a criminal offence. 